Ciao, buongiorno ragazzi. We are back once again. It's the Inter Worldwide podcast and I apologize for not bringing you some more content recently, but we've all been busy and you know what? The Serie A really has not changed its way, shape or form or structure since the last time we spoke. I'm joined by two of the world heavyweight champions, Alessandro. How you doing from San Fran, man? Everything's fine here. Hello, everybody. Sounds awesome. Sounds good. And my one and only PIC, Bruno, holding it down, working hard as usual. Always the case, mate. Always the case. And if I don't have a heart attack by the end of the season because of this team, I'll be count myself a lucky man. Mate, we'll be all counting our lucky stars by the end of the season. And that's what we're going to focus on in today's podcast. We've got the post-derby d'Italia um, talk coming from the Juventus match. Once again, I apologize for not bringing a podcast after that, but we were a little bit backed up. We're then going to talk a little bit about the stalemate in Udine. And then we are going to talk about the relative mediocre inconsistency of Serie A leading up to the final four. And boys, I don't know if... Wait, of course I know. Of course you both follow the English Premier League. Everyone follows the English Premier League. And it appears that that's not the only league where the clubs vying for the Champions League are having a bloody panic attack. Bruno, I'll start with you. Derby d'Italia, Inter versus Juventus, a chance to seal Champions League qualification in our home ground, in front of our home fans, against our biggest rival... We're just not used to that kind of happiness, bro, are we? No, and you know what? We've seen it time and time again. And you know what? This time last season, I was in a much more better state of mind in regards to Inter. And Inter were much worse off position on the table. Word. And this game here was just Inter's way of making the statement. Now, look, a, a point against Juventus is always a good result. But after you look at the actual match, and if you watch the full match, you realise Inter played a game of two halves, where the first half, they deserved to be up 2-0. They could not find that finish, and they paid for it in the second half. Simple as that. Yeah, absolutely. I'd have to agree. Alessandro, what were your thoughts on the Derby d'Italia? Um, obviously, the first 45 minutes, fantastic. The second 45 minutes, typical anxiety-stricken Inter and Spalletti. Yeah, it's uh, once again we're um, we're a two phases team, and uh, we're not able to have a, a little bit of consistency even in the ninety minutes. And uh, I'm sorry to I, I sound like a broken record, but I cannot see any anyone else uh, responsible if not the coach. He is the one uh, who should be addressing all this problem, especially. Uh, in, the, in the mind of the players and um, if um, as everybody else so uh, there is some problem during the game he should be the one addressing that make some tweak some change and um, not just wait for the best and hopefully somebody will score um, especially at this point of the season we we know that uh, defensively that the team is awesome and um, we need to, to create something. And I cannot believe in two seasons, the only thing he came, he came up with was uh, just ball to the winger, cross in the middle, let's hope for the best. That was the, the tactic he used for the last two years. Nothing else came out from that coach so uh, I'm pretty tired of that look I'm gonna have to 100% completely agree with Alessandro man I have watched every game this season and last season and I don't understand how a manager at this level can be so I'm sorry for swearing fucking one dimensional every single game we are seeing the same crap over and over again and what Alessandro said is 100% right we are a fantastic defensive team our our, incompet our incompetencies this season have really taken over the media spotlight and all the negative attention that's come on us has been bad. But when you analyze our defensive season, it's absolutely phenomenal. We have one of the best defensive records in Europe. Milan Skriniar, I am convinced, is a top five center back in the world. De Vrij is that competent. And we're going to have Diego Godin coming in next season. 
The defensive effort from us has been absolutely phenomenal, which is what makes it all the more frustrating that we can't piece together a goddamn attack besides, oh, Skrinia passed the ball to Brozovic. Brozovic hold it down and dish it out to Politano. Politano beats one player, cross it in, the ball gets headed back out. All the same thing happens on the left-hand side with Asamoah and Perisic. Um, before we go on to Udine, I did want to talk a little bit about that goal, though. Bruno, nine Golans hit. I know it's not good to celebrate moments where you don't get three points and stuff like that, but I think I've watched that goal over 300 times, man. How good is it to see Raja hitting peak form at the back end of the season, Bruno? And do you think he's going to carry this mentality into next season? And will he be the ninja warrior we're looking for in 2019-20? Look, I think that Nangalan coming into a completely different team, yes, the expectations were high, but you're coming into a completely different environment. He's got to learn each and every player. So you can't just expect him to jump right in and take over. He's not a Ronaldo, where Ronaldo will jump right in and take over, but Ronaldo has the independence where he can make magic for himself. Nangalan needs magic created for him at times, and that shot was amazing and I don't know if any of you watched the Manchester City game this morning but <laughs> it, yeah. Vincent Company pulled something just as good as that and that most probably won Manchester City the title but I still <laughs> say that Nyingeland's goal was amazing and you touched on defence earlier Anthony right just before we move on to Udinese we have the best goalkeeper in the league at the moment 16 clean sheets right with Three games remaining, he is two ahead of, I think it's Salvatore Sirigu on mm. 14, right? So we can't say our defence hasn't been the problem. And just back in Alessandro's statement earlier about Spalletti, and I've been very vocal with Spalletti, and everyone knows my opinion. He came in to get us the Champions League, right? Last season, he barely got us the Champions League. This season, we should have wrapped this up a long time ago and we are struggling. And you know what? When you've got a coach at the helm of, let's say, for instance, Luis Enrique at Barcelona, you've got the players on the field. You don't need to be a coach, right? You just need to be, you, you just have a title next to your name because those players go out and they do what they do because they're the best in the world. With teams like Inter, right? You look at Atalanta, their coach does everything for them. He picks the perfect team, the perfect players, the perfect um, formation and everything. Spalletti thinks he's at the helm of an amazing team. Yes, you have a great section, uh, selection of players, but at the same time, he's not capitalizing on what he has to offer. And he's just using every excuse under the sun. And I just feel we need to get rid of him. I don't care who comes in. Uh... His mentality does not apply for Inter anymore because he's not a... He's not a Champions League coach. Simple what as that. Savage, bro. So what you're saying is you want Gasparini at the helm next year, yeah? Bruno confirmed Gasparini in? No, I, I, I'd confirm <laughs> anyone else in. Anyone yeah. else in. Because at this current point in time, he's got the mentality that he's doing what needs to be done. He, yeah. They set the goal of Champions League and he's just achieving that. When you're a coach, you're meant to go for the... You're meant to be up there. You're meant to be the best of the best. And... You know what, it's just, it, it, it's, it's, it, as a fan, it's disgusting to see, you know, we're getting, we, yes, everyone argues, okay, Inter got knocked out of Champions League, but the two teams that were in our group are in the semifinals. Awesome. You don't go and face a team hoping to get a draw to qualify. That's it. It's Look, amateur. We'll, we'll speak a little bit more about Spalletti later on in the podcast when we talk about yeah. the relative strength of the league and how we're going to shape up and... Basically get the motivation and confidence to finish this goddamn campaign um, off because if the rumours are true, I swear to God, boys, we've got to be one of the most highlighted clubs in the media at the moment. Alessandro, I'm going to ask you this. After every match, after everything, there's something new in the media and Spalletti is now under scrutiny constantly, but we've still got an objective to achieve at the end of the day. So, Alessandro, what do you make of the constant negative media attention and... It's really starting to hurt us in our run home because I'm sorry to keep this going long, but if you're Spalletti and you know that you're on the chopping block, how do you get motivated and how do you motivate these players, Alessandro? 
Uh, that's a really good question. Unfortunately, I'm not the coach of Inter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would have a, a pretty simple answer. It's like, um, as everybody, I mean, it, it should be pretty simple. Uh, the goal of this season is going back to the Champions League. And I cannot believe that we're missing so many opportunities. Um, I mean, with, I don't think the problem was um, Icardi uh, with all the circular situation. And I don't think it was Nainggolan. Um, honestly, I, I don't think the problem uh, was um, the, all this media thing. Because once you're on the field, when you're, once you're playing, you forget all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I never play in Serie A, but even <laughs> in uh, the lower division that I played, when I was playing, that was it. I couldn't even remember what was what happened like right before the game or what happened at school and the, my family. Nothing. I was just playing, and that's it. So uh, going back to the Spalletti problem, that that's what it is because. This season, the whole uh, defense was awesome. It wasn't just Andanovic or Skriniar. Whoever was playing, I'm not the biggest fan of Don Brazio, but he, he did a really good season. And uh, the few goals that, um, that <clears throat> sorry, uh, the, the few goals that we um, can see were mostly for our own mistakes. Uh, yeah. or for, like, some crazy super goal from the other team. Uh, but overall, um, everybody in defense was good. The problem were from the midfield on, and um, we were lucky to to find some goal here and there from the winger or from Lautaro. Uh, but um, it, it was just luck. There was not, like, an idea and uh, and that's in my opinion that's the main reason why we cannot kiss Paletti another season. I understand the uh, the idea to have a, a long term project, yeah. but I can understand that if I see some uh, even like remote uh, idea on the field, and there is not, there is just a, a good idea of defense. Uh, but that's it, and the rest is like uh, just uh, give the ball to Brozovic, uh, open up the wings, cross in the middle. That's it. That, that yeah. was that. This is not acceptable. Sorry, and you cannot exactly. say like, oh, I didn't have the player as, <laughs> or, or I we need a better striker because uh, in this time and space, Icardi is lethal. So you have a good striker, yep. and uh, you can have also good wings because Politano mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, Perisic, when they want to play, they're good. It's just, yeah. it's very predictable. And uh, if you look at the game, especially with smaller teams, they're just waiting there for the crosses and, and add it out, yeah. that's it. So it, it's not because of the player. It's not because of the media situation, uh, even if they always attack us and that's, uh, you know, it's getting old. Uh, but it's just, if we want to uh, get rid of all this problem, we should have a better, a better uh, tactic. We, you should have a better uh, games to show. So at that exactly. point, nobody can attack us. But in this way... Yeah. Uh, of course, they're gonna uh, they're gonna attack every single mistake we're gonna make. Go for yeah. it, Bruno. You're waiting to jump in. I can tell. Look, I, I I I could not agree with someone more in regards to that. And Anthony, back to your question: How do you motivate someone who knows he's not gonna have a job? <laughs> who, which club will honestly sign him if this is his mentality as a coach? Right? He he should be going out with a bang. Because imagine that on your resume, you left the club, but you left them in a position where they were sitting ninth, 10th, 11th place. And when you left them, they were in Champions League. If you throw that out the window, 
which club's going to sign him? He's not going back to Roma. He's better off coming to Australia and coaching the Wanderers or something because at the end of the day, if you're going to throw, you don't throw you, any job. You work to your last day there. You don't just give up because you're no longer going to be there. Bro, I had to mute my microphone when you said the Wanderers shit because I just started laughing out of nowhere. You're just so funny. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> credit there, um, but let's move it on. We will move it on, and we're moving it on to Udine now. We went to Udine to take on Udinese, and this was meant to be it, ragazzi. This was meant to be the game where we get three points. We consider one point gained at Juve, one point gained at Roma, because we get the three points in Udine. Not meant to be. We saw what we already thought we were going to see. Static build-up. Not enough connectivity between the midfield and the attacking lines. Very, very typical play on the left-hand side by Perisic. To be honest, I love when Perisic goes one-on-one with defenders. I truly believe he's one of the best one-on-one left players in the world. You can't take him on -on one-on-one, but his end product is poor. It's almost like he's lacking that last 10% focus. It's like, all right, Matt, one crossover, two crossover, cross it in, deflection, corner. But... We've all seen our set pieces this weekend, Ragazzi. Man, we are one of the worst set piece teams in Europe. We can't even clear the bloody first man on a wall in a corner. So a lot of our stuff just falls on dead heads or dead legs. So, look, I don't know. The game against Udinese really, really encompassed that. And I'll talk a little bit with Bruno about that. We saw a dead, dead first 45 minutes. We saw substitutes from Spalletti, which I actually agreed with with the most part, but I would have bought Keita Balde in a little bit earlier. I'm not too sure what's going to happen with Keita Balde. Um, I'm pretty, pretty certain that we're not going to redeem him. But Bruno, what was your overall thoughts on the Udinese game? And was it just the most predictable outcome in Inter history or what, man? Look, I've always said it. You can never rely on Inter to get any three points anywhere. And I said that right before the Inter-Kiev game, um, the first half of the season, and look what happened there. So, I'm telling uh, look, I, it, was, it was boring. There was nothing there. And I don't know, there was no entertainment value. Like, I've seen some goalless draws being played out which have the entertainment value which, you know, can't compare to any other game. But this one here, it was just boring. And you said you hit the nail on the head. It was static. There was nothing there. And it just looked like a bunch of boys running around the park, just going through some training drills. But ultimately, I just feel, you, yeah, you said, the, um, you said the decision for the substitutions you think were well. But honestly, I don't, right? Okay, taking off Valero to bring on Icardi, I think was a great choice. You know, he, you bring him on, two strikers up front, that's perfect. Now, you take Politano off to bring on Kandreva, right? <laughs> I, I don't get that. Bring on Balde, leave two strikers with another great attacker. And you know what? We've seen it before where Keita and Martinez freaking... Uh, 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 instrumental when they played <laughs> together but Spalletti doesn't want to go back to that because it was so successful right because apparently if you're successful once it's not going to happen again <laughs> right and he's got the mentality well this has failed that many times this season surely it's going to work this time no it's not right and so yes you take off Valero that bringing on Icardi I reckon on the one hour mark was perfect and I thought, okay, we're going to see some traction. Then he takes off Politano. I'm like, oh, beautiful. You know, Keita's going to come on. You know, we've got the striker. No, nah, Kandreva walks up, right? He must have dropped his walking stick and went straight there because at the end of the day, what's he done for Inter this season? He scored one goal and that's it. But then you take off Martinez, who has been in form, you know, here and there, and he loves... He loves to be on the pitch and has shown his passion for Inter. And you bring on, you know, Kate. I just don't see the logic behind it. I don't see the passion in the players. I think they thought they did not need to try to get the three points. And again, like always, they proved themselves wrong. 
And unfortunately, results went our way this weekend. Look, but actually, we won't be- they, no, no, I'll interrupt you there, Bruno. They proved themselves right. And that's part of the goddamn problem. Because the yeah. relative strength of Serie A at the moment is absolutely poor. I've said this to so many people this week, and I'll keep saying it. If Inter didn't exist, I would not watch Serie A if you paid me, man. It is yeah. honestly, it, it's a horrible league at the moment with inconsistent eh, sides. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you know what? It, it, it was disgusting. As And you know what? I, I, I copped a lot of controversy from my latest article that I put up. Do Inter deserve to be in Champions League? And I blatantly said no. And everyone's like, no, yes, we do. Yes, we do. But That's honestly, awful. how can you compete with this? How yeah. can you have this sort of team with this mentality, right? And I just feel after the Udinese, it, it, was, it was borderline shameful, the performance that was put in. And cow- you know what? Shit, isn't it? Right. Unfortunately, we were fortunate enough for Roma to drop points as well. And, you know, Milan lost a couple of games. So them winning really just put them back on par with Roma. But if Inter won that, that would have been... Game, set, match, basic, bro. Game, oh, set, match. Yes. And now, now we're back to old habits where, you know, typical Inter fashion, we do it the hard way. There's no easy way. Yeah, 100%. And, and it, I just think that, you know, do we deserve to be there? I think personally, Inter will perform better next season if they don't make Champions League because it'll be a wake-up call to the whole fucking team. Well, Pardon well, my French. We're, we're going we're gonna to pretty much focus on that for the rest of the podcast, the outcome of this season and how it, the relative strength of the Serie A. And we're going to swing this back to Alessandro now. So with the Juventus and the Udinese games out of the way, we've completed match day 35. We've got three games left till the end of the season. Now... If you came up to me at the start of the season, Alessandro, talking to you, and you said that with three games left, we have a one-point lead on fourth and a four-point lead on fifth, and all we need to do is beat two teams in the bottom three, I would have bit your hand off straight away. Because as Bruno mentioned earlier in the podcast, I feel shitter right now than I did at this point last season. But at this point last season, we were still fifth or sixth or something like that. We were looking at Lazio, hoping they drop points. So, Alessandro, going into the final three matches of the season, we're going to start with Kievo. How are you feeling about Kievo, man? Okay, so... (laughs) um, um, I have a, a really quick answer for this question, but I, I would like to go back to uh, the previous one once I'm done. Cool. Uh, so my quick answer is um, maybe I'm crazy and probably people is going to threat me to death uh, at the end of the, <laughs> of the season, but uh, I'm pretty sure we, we're going to make it with no problem and uh, uh, be- between uh, Kiev, Napoli and Empoli the only um, the only game that can be difficult is is the last one with Empoli if they're still fighting to not be relegated. In in that case, uh, I don't know what's gonna happen. But uh, I think if we make four points out of these nine, like the bare minimum four points, we should be fine. Uh, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe my math is all wrong whatever, but uh, if you look at the game of the other teams and all the combination and blah, 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 uh, <laughs> I think that should, should be enough. So that's my quick answer. Uh, we, we're playing home against Kievo. Uh, they don't have any reason to fight, even though they're saying so, and they're saying like, oh, we're going to play, blah, blah, blah. Not going to happen, probably. <laughs> Uh, same thing for Napoli. Napoli is, is second. Uh, they're not gonna uh, gain any anything from a victory. They're not gonna uh, lose anything uh, if we win. So that they don't really care. And uh, hopefully that even if we make one point there, should be enough uh, for us to go in the last game and and uh, be a little bit more relaxed. 
<clears throat> going back on the more like um, uh, wide uh, question about Serie A and uh, how we are in this situation with all this team. Um, a, a little bit of history. I grew up when Serie A, and I think all of us um, grew up with the Serie A was like the best soccer team in the world. Uh, sorry, soccer yeah. league in the world. You know, yep. that was like the best players, the best team. Uh, I mean, that was before the crazy Barcelona, Real Madrid, Messi, Ronaldo. That was before um, Manchester City becoming this like superpower. Um, so we grew up in an awesome environment for Serie A soccer. Um, after that, what happened, uh, the team were basically financed by these super rich people. And um, for one is- reason or another, um, they, this thing wasn't sustainable. So um, UEFA decided to apply more strict rules, and therefore we have the financial fair play. Uh, that means that a lot of team fail or they change the presidency and uh, that's why the two city in Milan uh, from Berlusconi and Moratti they have to go through a series of president and weird situation and uh, this was not good for Serie A in general not just for us um, at the same time, Roma did the same. From Sensi, now is owned by uh, Palotta. Um, if, if you look at uh, all the teams, um, Juve is the only one that has a little bit of consistency uh, because basically it's just a generation from one Agnelli to the other. Uh, but the family is still the same. The people inside still the same. Uh, that aside from the Serie B um, BS, uh, because I mean the relegation. Well, okay, that's that's just a completely different topic. I don't want to, <laughs> you know, that's too complicated. Anyway, um, th- these all things uh, brought us to uh, this situation this year in particular. Um, Inter, Milan, Roma, uh, they are trying to um, stay competitive and the, the main goal for everybody is to go back to the Champions League because it's the main source of money at this point. Juve is where it is because it got uh, a long uh, run in the, in the Champions League. Napoli even more, because between Champions League and uh, Europa League, um, I think that the most most consistent um, Italian team, and uh, and you can see the result. Um, Inter, Milan, Lazio, Roma, they did not have this luck or this consistency for all the reasons I just said. Um, and you can see it. I mean, uh, it's it's simple, uh, even if it's not so simple. And um, hopefully, uh, if we are able to um, return in Champions League next year, um, I mean, it's massive. I think the the profit this year were around fifty million. Uh, yeah. considering that in total we have, last year we had 300, adding 50, it's a lot. Yeah. And uh, going back another year, uh, that means we don't have to sell many players, we can uh, keep uh, a longer list of players in uh, in Europe, thing that we didn't have this year. Uh, it means that we don't have a lot of problem and uh, we have a possibility to grow um, to do that I think we also need a better coach and the thing that um, 
uh, changing coach, even if expensive, doesn't uh, um, doesn't bring any problem in the financial fair play. This is something that everybody should know because I, I read articles where they were counting the millions and uh, uh, the, they were saying like, oh, if you bring Conte, it's gonna yeah. um, it's gonna be a problem because it's like 20 million and Inter already needs to to bring 50 million on the table. That's not a story. Uh, the the coach is not part of the financial fair play. And um, that's it. <laughs> I don't want to add anything more. Hey, no, no, Alessandro. Sorry, look. Like, no, thanks for bringing that piece of information to us, Alessandro, because it's very helpful. And I knew that as well, but I'm, I'm willing to bet so many of our listeners didn't. And you know what? When I first heard that story come out about seven to ten days ago that, oh, it will cost Inter minus 18 million in profit to bring in Conte and Sax Spalletti, I was like, oh, yeah, look, it is a bit expensive. But what Alessandro says is 100% true. You know, we got to Champions League last season and we still couldn't fully break the shackles of financial fair play. This season, the only thing standing between us and full financial freedom is qualifying for this goddamn tournament. If we qualify for this tournament, basically Suning will then get the license to sell one player, which will be either Perisic or Riccardi. We know this. And then after that, the club will have the freedom it needs to go and spend whatever it wants. Exactly. And if what Alessandro is saying is true, and I know it is, is that the impact of hiring a new manager does not impact, impact on FFP. Man, that's pocket money to me. And I don't give a shit what any past fans say. Conte is a winner. He's hell-bent on protecting his ego, something that Spalletti has absolutely no interest in whatsoever. So... I'm, I'm all on board yep, for any yep. sort of change from Conte or Mourinho to come in. Bruno, I can tell you're keen to jump in, but before you do, we're just going to move in on quickly to the run-in, which I know you're more than equipped to handle anyway. So, conscious of time, we're looking at covering Milan, Roma, Atalanta, and Inter's final three fixtures here. We're going to move on to a couple of fan questions afterwards as well. Is that all right with you, boys? Perfect. All right, beautiful. Sure. I will start with you, Bruninho, my friend, and we are starting with AC Milan. Kudos to them for getting the win this morning against Bologna. Me, personally, I want them out of the top four, and I will tell you why. So many fans think, oh, we want Milan to be in the top four. It'll bring more prestige to Serie A. It's good to have a giant back in top four. No. I don't want Milan in the top four because if they get into the Champions League, they are going to attract names that otherwise we could be interested in. As soon as AC Milan get their name back into the Champions League, players will flock there like flies on a piece of shit. So, towards now, towards the, uh, from now towards the end of the season, after winning 2-1 against Bologna, which presented two red cards, they will be missing Paqueta in their next game. Bruno, Fiorentina in Florence, Frosinone at the San Siro, Spal in Spal. Or at Spal, sorry. Where do you think Milan end this season in terms of points? I think Milan have a lot more to lose and a lot more to gain than most teams. For especially sure. after the transfer window they had leading into this season. After the amazing one, the kid Piatek joining and basically just misfiring. Um, yeah, he had a couple of stellar games. But... Milan cannot be ridden off. No. I can't see. I can. I can see Milan getting nine from nine points. Yep, that's I what I'm. Milan, I can. I can see Milan getting three from nine points with three <laughs> draws. You can. Milan has a, the consistency rate of Inter, right? And they can do amazing things, but they can also slump very quickly. Now, Fiorentina, they have nothing to play for. They're a mid-table team. They're, they're not going to get relegated. They're not going to get into Europa. They've got nothing to play for except for pride. And pride is something. But as, as much as that, we have learned from Fiorentina that their favourite result is a draw. They love okay? it. Okay, And we can't take that fact away from them. So Fiorentina, I can see being 1-1, nil nil. That's being optimistic. Um, being in Florence, I can also see that favouring Fiorentina. 
Frosinone, relegation. It looms. They're out. They're out. What do they have to play for? It's done, cuz. Pride. It's finished. Pride. Pride. Now, Alessandro uh, mentioned Kievo, right? They're the flying donkeys. They're the bogey team for a lot of teams. And Inter struggled against them first half of the season when they had, I think, no wins up to that point. And Inter struggled against them. Frosinone, didn't they beat Juventus? No, nah, definitely not. No, sorry. Genoa beat Juventus. Genoa beat Juventus, sorry. Yes, I stand corrected there. But Frosinone have found a bit more form in the last six to seven games compared to their other counterparts. In saying that, again, they've got nothing to play for. Spal, again, nothing They're good. to play for. No, nah, they've, they've had some good, attractive football, man. Some people have said that Spal have played some of the most entertaining football of the season. Yeah, but again, they're mid-table. Nothing they, to play for. They've got nothing to play for. It, 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 it would be surprising to me if they don't get nine from nine. All but right, it would so also be surprising to me if they don't get three from nine. All right, so uh, what are you going to seven, seven or nine? Make a pick. Seven. 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 All right, Matt. Alessandro, over to you. Florence in Firenze, uh, Milan hosting Frosinone, and then travelling to Spal. What do you reckon, Alessandro? Um, very short. I think they're going to lose at Firenze because Montella uh, is an ex. And uh, it, did, it did nothing so far. So if he can win against Milan and at the, the, the end of his season, probably. Um, so losing Firenze and probably draw the other two. So, oh, wow. So you're going Milan to get only two points. Two from two nine. Well, uh, I like that. I love that. I love that. I love that. <laughs> it's the best thing I've ever heard in my fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on quickly because I'm conscious of time. Uh, who's next on the list? Roma. Roma. Now, full credit to Ranieri. I don't like him as a coach. I actually would hate him as a coach. I love him as a human being. He somehow knows how to grind out that passion and that grinta from their players. Even if they don't respect his technical side, they're going to fight for him no matter what. The big problem is Roma's fixture list from now to the end of the season is right up their ass. It is not good at all. They need to host Juventus at the Olimpico. They then need to travel to Sassuolo and then Roma take on Parma at home. So, Bruno, I'll start with you. By the way, for the record, I've got Milan down for nine points out of nine because everyone knows how I operate. I go optimistic for rivals, pessimistic for Inter. So, switching over to Roma, Bruno, at the Olimpico, Roma, Juve, Essa Suolo, Sassuolo, Roma, at the Olimpico, Roma, Parma. Off you go, mate. Six from nine. I can see Juventus taking it. Um regardless of the fact that they've got nothing to play for, they like to perform against big teams. And they their fans will not want anything less because they're a massive team and their fan base holds it against them, even though no one really celebrated them winning the Scudetto. No, that but was fucking hilarious, man. That How was terrible. Was the fake smiles on the face. How good yeah. was that? But um, the, uh, Juventus also have one thing that Roma don't, and that's Ronaldo. And as much as I dislike um, the player as an ego, you can't dislike the player because of his skill. And he, wants, he, he carries wants the it. Top scorer. He wants, that, he top wants scorer. that top scorer and he hasn't got much time to do it. And what a name he'd make for himself if it was done at Roma. I can see them getting two wins in their final two matches um, with, two, uh, with a loss against Juve. Six points. Six points. All right, sounds good to me. Alessandro, do I need to repeat the Roma statistics, or you've got the are uh, the Roma fixtures, or you got them down? I got it. Um, I think um, they, I think the six points are correct, but uh, I think they're gonna make three points against Juve. Basically, they're gonna win the home games uh, and lose uh, against Sassuolo. So six it's points. Nice. You think you think they lose against a swallow though? Yeah. So uh, I'm pretty sure they're gonna win against Juve. Uh, they don't like the swallow. 
uh, match. And uh, I don't know if uh, the last game um, is against Parma, right? Yeah, Parma. Yeah, I, I don't know. It really depends how they get to the final game, if they have all the players or not. And uh, um, that that can be a tricky one. Uh, being pessimistic, uh, they're probably going to win it. But um, that's not 100%. So we said, I don't know, like four to six points. Four to six points. That sounds about right to me as well. I've got them down for six. I think personally, I'd actually agree with you, Alessandro. I think they have stand a good chance of winning against Juventus. But I've got them down as a draw. And I think they win their last two games. Again, me being more optimistic for the opposition and pessimistic for Inter. Um, The next one. Guys, we need to talk a little bit about Atalanta because I am extremely impressed at the moment with what they are doing. They seem to be able to fight tooth and nail. They just came off the back of a 3-1 win against Lazio, who are now basically officially eliminated from the Champions League spots after looking like they would certainly get a spot a few weeks ago after beating us 1-0 at the Miazza. So Atalanta's final fixtures. Bruno, you ready, brother? Yep, let's go. All right. See, Atalanta start off a little... Uh, Atalanta have it a little bit tougher. Um, they host Genoa, who are not a bad side, but after expending all their energy against Roma, you can probably write that off as an L for Genoa. However, they will play Juventus following that in Turin. But the big kicker to that, Ragazzi, the match against Genoa, Atalanta-Genoa, 11th of May, Atalanta, Atalanta, yeah, Atalanta Juventus, 19th of May. Atalanta Lazio Coppa Italia final, 16th of May. Smack bang in the middle. Do you see Atalanta dropping points in Turin, Bruno? Okay, you've stolen my gear there because that's Sorry. what I was going for. But, <laughs> no, that's fine, mate. Look, Atalanta, 10 games undefeated in the Serie A so far this year. Right, they've had an amazing run, right? And Genoa, we've all seen. They're not a walk in the park. They handed Juventus their first loss of the season. They're not a walk in the park. But Atalanta have the Coppa final. Now, I predicted before Lazio would lose against Atalanta in the Serie A. Why? You don't show all your cards, especially when there's a trophy on the line. And this Coppa, uh, this Coppa final means a lot for Lazio, considering they will get into Europe if they win it. Not the Champions League, but they'll get into Europe. Now, that being said, will take a lot of energy out of Atalanta. Because the last thing you want is to go this whole season, have this 10-game streak, and not walk away with any silverware. So they're going to go tooth and nail. Then they're going to travel to Turin. Now, I've got Atalanta down for four out of nine points. And for them to lose the Coppa Italia final. Just because... Lazio have a lot more riding in this final. Their season was based on them getting to the final. And Lazio have been in the final a lot more times than many of the other teams um, in the last five, six years, to be honest. And I just feel Lazio will take the final. Um, Like I said, they've got a lot more riding. But a, a draw against Genoa, a loss to Juventus in Turin, and um, a win against the Swallow in the final match. All right, sounds good. And Alessandro, moving on to you and Atalanta. So Bruno said four points, which, you know, isn't ecstatic, but, you know, they can still do something with that. What are your thoughts on Atalanta? Um, I don't know, man. Um, today, or was yesterday, Gasperini was saying how he would uh, rather lose the Coppa Italia but get in Champions League. And that's like a very strong message. Um, so uh, the way they're playing right now, they can make nine points out of nine and probably win the Coppa Italia too. Uh, it's like that good, uh, no matter the team they're playing against. So even if they have at- um, Juventus um, after the, it's right after the Coppa Italia, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Right after the Coppa Italia, like two, two and a half days, three days after. Three days later. 
Yeah, so if they win the Coppa Italia, they're going to be over the moon. And you never know, they can just win because of that. Uh, if they lose the Coppa Italia, they're going to play even harder to at least qualify for the Champions League. So, I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I think they can do nine out of nine. Nine out of nine. How interesting. I'm going to write that down and we're about to do the maths. All right. <laughs> nine. So if they're on, hold up, let me just get this table up for a second, just one more time. If they're on 62, holy shit, that's scary, Alessandro. We're gonna end 71 <laughs> points. 71 points. Damn. All right, well, we're not going to do Inter because, um, yeah, actually, you know what? Why not? Let's do Inter as well. This is going to look really bad. Um, Bruno, just quickly, don't, don't digest Napoli, the game. Napoli. No, no, no. Don't digest the games. Just give us points. Chievo, Napoli, Empoli. Give us points, Four. please. Four. Shit. Four. Alessandro, right. Chievo, and... Napoli. No, no, wait, 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 uh, wait, wait, wait. Let me let just make one quick statement on Napoli, okay? Because everyone thinks Napoli has nothing to play for. Just remember the passion and the drama of the last time we played Napoli. They're going to yeah. want vengeance. That's it. That's all I've got to say. But four points for Inter. Jeez, four points I, for Inter. I say five. Five? I'm going to go with six. I reckon six. All right, cool. And how many points are we on at the moment? We are on 63. So 63. That leaves Bruno putting us at 67, Alessandro putting us at 68, and I put us at 69. All right, very good. Um, I'm actually going to do a little bit of maths now while we're waiting. So while we do that, I'm going to send over to Bruno and Alessandro for a couple of questions to finish us off for this podcast, which has been amazing. Thank you to my boys for joining me. Question one comes from Darren from Melbourne. It's a beautiful Aussie name, Darren. Thanks for writing in. You can replace Icardi with any forward in Serie A. Who do you choose? Dot, dot, dot. You cannot choose Ronaldo. Very specific question. Thank you very much, Daza. Over to you first, Bruno, man. Any forward in Serie A to replace Icardi, not Cristiano. Oh, it's a very, it's a very top one. Uh, tough one, Daza. So... <laughs> Let me break it down, mate. Look, um, I'd love Quagirella with the form he's had this season. But um, got, I can't go past Zapata. Zapata's my man. You're Alessandro, what do you think? He actually said Quagirella. <laughs> no, nah, like, full respect. He's, he's amazing. He's done really well. But well, the be... form he's had this season. Oh, mate. The but this form will... he's had this season. This will be the last season he clocks that. It's literally Luca Tony for Hellas Verona version 2. Alessandro, your answer to the question. You can replace Icardi with any forward in Serie A. Who do you choose? I'd choose probably Milik. Nice. Just because um, of the structure he has and the technical ability and the um, um, and, uh, goal kick. Goal kick? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, and the free kick. Very nice. Um, well, I would agree with Alessandro. I actually think Milik is fantastic, but to be honest, I was leaning more towards Zapata as well. I think Zapata's off-the-ball movement is nothing sort of, uh, short of sensational, not to mention his first touch. His first goal on the weekend for, um, for Atalanta was brilliant, in my opinion, the way he takes that ball down so close to the keeper. So I'd probably go with Zapata as well. Next question, and it's from MD Uridin from Sri Lanka. Thank you so much for writing in, brother. I really appreciate that. I'll send you a message after this as well. Who do you want to qualify with Inter for top four if you had a choice of the other team? Bruno, over to you first. I'd love to see Atalanta there just because the passion they've shown this season. No one put them on the numbers that we're going to pull this season and it's just that fairy tale ending. I'd have to say Atalanta. Alessandro, what do you think? I, I have to agree with you. Not only because I like the soccer they're playing, but because in that way, Roma and Milan are out of Champions League. <laughs> so <it's good. laughs> nice one, nice one. Uh, question three comes from Marcus from Sydney. 
Does Lautaro Martinez earn himself as a starting striker for Inter next season? Or if Icardi leaves, do we need to replace him properly? So basically what this question is saying is, do you guys trust Lautaro to be our front man next season? Or do we need to replace Icardi with someone more competent? Alessandro, you first. So, um, quick answer. No, I don't, I don't think he's ready. Okay. Um, and I know it's controversial, but I would keep Icardi too. And yeah, uh, yeah that's it. The, you, can, you can write me emails <laughs> just insulting me. Uh, but uh, I would keep the, the two strikers and uh, I would try to make them work together. That's, that's the plan for me. But. Sounds good to me. Uh, Bruno, is Lautaro ready or do you agree with Alessandro, man? I think Lartaro has proven himself to be capable of ready. Um, I just think mentally he isn't ready. And I don't want his ego growing too much, thinking, you know, he's been there one season and he's going to be the permanent starter. In saying that, I'd love to see us start with two strikers on the field. So he, he should be there. Well said, man. I would have to agree. Uh, and the last question is from myself. And for the first time ever, we are going completely off Italia in this podcast. So I already know the answer to this question from both of you, but I want every single listener to hear it. Liverpool and Manchester City have produced one of the best title races I have ever seen in my life. It has come down to the wire in the last few fixtures and it's coming down to the last day. Vincent Kompany, the captain, capitano for Manchester City from 30 yards out this morning, hit a screamer into the top corner. Alessandro, if you had to pick, who do you want to win the English title this year? Liverpool or Man City and why? Everybody but Liverpool. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> that should explain it. All right. Well said. And Bruno, uh, who do you want to win the English title this year, man? Like, you're not a Man City fan or anything, are you? <laughs> Look, regardless, I just want to take back what you said in regards to being the best Premier League finish we've seen in a long time. <laughs> you as a United fan should remember um, <laughs> back a couple of years where, you know, Aguero pumped that goal in to take it and my favourite Balotelli there won the Premier League with Manchester City. But no, look, I just think um, Manchester City have proven, you know, they were the money team. They were bought out by Arab owners and they were the money team. But I just feel they've done a lot. And um, I just think they've got it. And I'm not going to be biased, but they're amazing. And Forza, Manchester City. You're going to regret that, man. I'm going to crop that three seconds out and post it on every single platform we've got. Anyway, um, I'm going to have to agree mostly with Alessandro. Screw Liverpool and all their fans to high hell. I haven't been able to stand them my whole life. Can't stand them this season. And, yeah, let's hope it ends with Man City lifting that title. Guys, that's all we have time I have for. to say, that there was just one, one instance where I, I was, like, rooting for Liverpool, and that was against Milan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100%, man. I, I actually was as well. Um, all right, guys, that's all we've got time for today. It's been a very, hold very... Hold on, hold on, hold on. What about what? your what? map? So... Oh, yeah, Ooh. shit, I completely forgot. I've got it written down right here. So, surprisingly enough, Bruno, you're the only one who's got us in third position. Bruno's standings has Inter third, 67. Milan, fourth, 66. Atalanta, fifth, 66. Now, I need to, does anyone know off the top of their head who's got the head-to-head -head on Atalanta-Milan? Because that might change. Mm, no. Oh, good. I got, give me, give me the Probably I'll be answer. Uh, oh, I don't want Milan in fourth, so change mine to uh, uh, Milan in fifth. I, nah. Nah, nah, I nah. just think Milan's Atalanta the head -to -head. do. Milan have the head to head, but I do think they've got a pretty straight from a forward run home. Yeah. So it's Inter, Milan, Atalanta for Bruno, 345. For Alessandro, Atalanta third, 71. Inter fourth, 68. Roma, 5th, 65.
For Anthony, myself, uh, it's changed a little bit from a couple of weeks ago. I've got Atalanta third 69, Inter fourth 69, Milan fifth 68. Either way, guys, the panic isn't going to finish anytime soon unless we get three points from Kiev and either one of Atalanta, Napoli, uh, sorry, Atalanta, Roma or Milan completely slip up this weekend. Guys, we are going to be back at you with a podcast next weekend. Just as much panic, just as much anxiety. I am hell-bent and convinced that this season is not finished anytime soon for Inter. I'm sure my co-panelists agree. Alessandro, thanks so much for joining me, brother. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And sorry for the history lesson and for this extra long podcast. No, that's okay. I think everyone was craving it after the absence. And Bruno, see you soon, man. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. And as always, Forza Inter. Absolutely. And from all of us here, Forza Inter per sempre, Forza Inter worldwide. Ciao, ragazzi.